and this is what I've got. So I'm going to do a, a little bit of a demonstration on how to set up a still life. And this would actually be useful no matter what class you're in because I strongly believe in working from observation whenever you can. So there is um, something to be said for actually, um, and I do this a lot with my own work, setting up miniatures or which is how they used to do it in the old days for, for film and stuff. You know, they would have little miniature ships or spaceships, if you remember the old Star Trek stuff, when somebody was, you know, pulling wires. And Now, now this light, this is, this light that I'm using here is an OT light, which is a um, full-spectrum light, and that, if you're working with color, that's going to be superior for your color um, or anything you want to do in color. All right, move this guy over here. Move this guy over here. And I won't always be in the dark, but I am right now. So we'll just um, live with it. Okay, so this is where I'm going to set up my still life. Not on the camera, though. You want to try? I'd like to try to set up the still life in such a way that you're going to see the same thing I'm seeing. Um, you want to actually angle your drawing board so that you're facing the still life, okay? We'll get this sorted out. It'll be great. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so cool. You guys are just going to like be so amazed when I get this all sorted out. I'm all excited. I always get all excited when I, you know, it's like it's like decorating, you know, it's like renovating, decorating, just getting getting things set up so that it's just perfect. It's going to be so cool. All right. All right, so have your board angled up. And if it's not angled up enough, you need to prop it up. Actually, the best way to do it is you sit down at your, draw at your drawing table, not even using a drawing table. The best way to do it is to sit there with your board on your lap like this, so that it's like this. And you're angled so that you can see your drawing, your still life, right straight in front of you. However, that's not great for the camera. So... I'm doing it like this, but I would like you guys, it would be better to sit, when you sit with your still life, to sit up so that you have your knee, your board resting on your knees and the and on the table or whatever workspace you're using. That is going to be much, much better for getting the right angle on your, uh, on your view. So I'll prop this up a little higher so I have a better point of view on my own work. And... Put a square here to see how. So see how it's a little bit bigger than it is here, and it's not really. So I need to adjust that so that it's squared up, so that you're not getting. And this is how you should be looking at it yourself. It's, of course, that's a little bit weird to say. You know, look at your to look at your um, board square, but you'll. You'll be able to know. I just try to set the camera up in such a way that it isn't distorting my drawing for you guys. There, now that's square. See how that works? Okay, good. Now, setting up the still life, and you can do this with anything. I used to do um, sculpt little things out of... Actually, I'm going to set up a fun still life because I'm going to be doing this. I want to do this... Uh, dragon. Oh, except I don't know where the dragon is, so scratch that. You can take anything and put it into a, a still life setup that will allow you to miniaturize it. So you can have like a, a little doll and a big monster and use those, set those up and light them so you get all the lighting and everything just right. 
and then draw them very realistically. Oh, I found the dragon. Cool. Here. So this dragon is going to become a realistic dragon when I get done with it. He doesn't look realistic right now. He looks kind of dopey, you know, because he's painted and he's kind of nasty. He's kind of nasty looking on many levels. So go through, you know, go go to uh, this. This should be a working studio. Is I mean, if you're going to be drawing realistic stuff, and of course, when you work with 3D stuff, you could just build it and render it, and which would be exactly the same thing as what we're doing now, except you're letting the computer do a lot of the work. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't know how to do it. You know, it's in fact, I was just talking to my boss today, and he's designing a course on. Um, um, concept design and what a lot of people are doing now is setting up their concepts they sketch you do still do the sketch like everyone like you like we're doing now you do the sketches of your character your concept or whatever and then you put that into your you can do it digitally that's fine but then you render out uh, a figure but that doesn't mean you don't know how to draw the figure you have to to know how to draw the figure first Anyway, I don't know if I'm making any sense. Anyway, my little dragon guy. Okay, that's cool. But the light sucks, okay? It's all about the light. If the light sucks, the whole thing sucks. Just remember, we're going to change the light to come from this side. A nice directional light. Clamp lights are great. I highly recommend using clamp lights. You want to get an interesting cast. Okay, but we're getting a lot of light in the background. That's the thing that we really want to fix. And the way that I do it, you can use a cardboard box or you can use a screen or you can prop up some cardboard or... <sighs> I lost my mirror. I will use sometimes you just have to be innovative and use whatever you can come up with. A cardboard box would work. But I'm using, just propping up a board is going to help. Move the light back a little bit. So he comes out of this light. Let me turn this down. Oops. We don't want to get the, this light off of it because we don't want that light on on the model. We just want... Some really, oh, I know what it is. It's this light here. See, kind of sometimes you have to be a little bit of a detective to find out where the light's coming from. There. See how that works? Much better. It's not totally blocked off, but it's getting there. And I could fiddle with it more. I could put a taller piece up so that it's blocking it even more. But I really want to get the the light behind this area to be shadowed out so that the the creature is against the dark shadow of the background. Does that make sense? You guys following me on this? Okay. Feedback, people. Feedback. I need feedback. Give me a little feedback. Oh, God, that's so bright. This is not going to be a good work light for me. I'm going to have to do something different, but not right now. Okay, so. It's not in great focus. In fact, it's super pixely. So I'm going to take a photograph of it 
just so that you can see. I will work from the still life, not from the photograph of the still life. And so this is just for demonstration purposes. So for my, and this, when you take pictures of your own work, just to show me how you were, um, you guys that are doing the still lives, how you were doing your still life, you want to make sure that you put your cameras exactly in front of your eyeball, where exactly where it's going to be looking at your still life. Before I do that, I'm going to put in a couple of objects, other objects, because we need something for sighting, something to compare it to. Oh, <laughs> maybe I'll put in a little fairy girl. Oh, help me. I'm being attacked by a monster. Wow, that is so blowing out. It's really bad on the webcam. Yeah, it's white, white, white. It's it's not like that for for me. It's only like that for the camera. I think. It's something to do with this particular camera. But let me let me send the picture to my computer. And you can see more what I'm seeing. I would love to find out more about different kinds of cameras that can be used for this stuff because I'm really disappointed with the the quality of the camera that I'm using. The the overhead webcam is pretty good, but the other cameras are not really gr great. And if you guys have any suggestions for if anybody does YouTubing stuff, like what kind of cameras do you use to do YouTube or to do live web streaming. Okay, no problem, Sarah. I'm recording this, so it's all right. Um, all right, let me add back in this picture so you can see what I'm actually seeing. big. But you guys should have all gotten a, um, a little link to a, how to set up or the information on setting up OBS so that you could do your setup so that I can see you draw or I can see how what your setup is like. That would be for more one-on-one. -on -one. So that's what it's really looking like. We've got some better lighting on the on that little guy there. So I'll put these guys kind of side by side so we have both options. No matter what, the human eye is going to be better at um, viewing whatever you're looking at, whether it's in color or in value or even um, acuity you know, how things are, um, I'm sorry, it's hard for me to talk and work at the same time right now. I'm just not totally doing that well. And this video, video, idio video, <laughs> idio video will not be, will not be edited it's going to be, it is what it is. And you can see the difference in the colors 
every camera is different, right? So, and even every computer screen is different. So you have to keep that all that stuff in mind as well when you are um, working digitally or traditionally. That the differences in how your work is going to be shown is, or how they're going to see it. Like most people are only going to see your work in reproduction. If you think about that, then it's um, it's kind of clear that whatever you do has to be has to look good across. Well, when you're doing like when you're doing games, that's one thing that we we used to have to struggle with was work, when you're working in video games, trying it out on different platforms. Or if you guys if you've done web browsing, which I'm sure that plenty of you guys have done some web browsing or web web design, you have to try it on several different browsers to see if it works, right? So it's kind of the same thing with with art and with drawing. All right. So I actually want to use this dragon in a painting that I'm doing. Um, the painting is of a it's a portrait of a girl, and she likes to play D Dungeons and Dragons. So she had wanted a little dragon on the surface where she's. You'll see it because I'm going to be painting it and I'm going to be streaming it too. And I'm going to, I, she gave me this dragon to use and I'm going to use him as a base, but I'm also going to make him look really super realistic so that um, it looks like there's a little tiny real life, real life dragon sitting in the portrait with her. You know what I mean? This is a great way to utilize all of your skills that you're learning with observational drawing. Because I'm going to get a better, I better look, a better realistic, more realistic looking dragon if I have that object actually there that I can look at to study the, how the light is falling on it and how it, it's behaving in the, um, the colors and all that stuff. And you could even put colored lights on it to make it even more interesting. So anybody have any questions so far? Just holler if you do. I'm interested to know what what you guys might might say. And tomorrow or later, if uh, those of you that are in the um, 122 class, I've got a, t a thing I need to show you guys how to deal with the PDF requirement. I'll probably just record it and post it but allow you to come and see it. I'm not going to try to do it at any specific time, but okay. So now we're going to, you've, we've done a little bit of, oh, okay. So the one thing that I really wanted to focus on was, do you really see as much of the top of the box as you think you do? And this desk is a little bit higher than it used to be. So I'm going to have to work it out. No, you don't see as much of it. Actually, I can't see my still life. I should have raised it up a little higher. I'm going to have to do it this way. Okay. So make sure that you're using your sighting when you're doing this so that things are coming across. Oops. I've got multiple lights in that source. I don't like that. Single source of light is super important. You don't want any bleed over. The photograph is a little bit better than the. Anyway, find your find your point of unit, your unit of measure, which is usually a simple, a smallish object, and use that to measure. Keeping your arms straight, we're going to see how many units are in that box. One, two units, three units up to the back of the box. So just as an example, when you're drawing the top of an object, your mind is going to see it as much larger than it really is. So you can do your sketching, your gesture sketch to start, and then develop the check your, um, I'm not warmed up. This is really awful to try to draw when you're not warmed up. You can really hurt yourself. Hurt your <laughs> hurt your pride. <laughs> sort of like trying to play music without having tuned up your instrument. 
So the ball, if I put the ball in here as a measuring device, I can already see that it is the back of this object is lower on the horizontal than that ball is. So if I'm not going to make that ball too big, so now, now I've got to struggle. It's a little bit of a struggle. It's a fight back and forth between the size of the ball, where it's placed on the top of this object. Look at the negative shapes all around this object. It's, to get the angle right, you can hold your pencil up to the angle that you see and carefully take it to your paper and see if you've got the same angle. And it's almost like you have to turn off your brain and just see, force yourself to draw the shape as you really see it, as, as if you had a grid on it. So that's what the sighting is really useful for. So you take your measure, and each time you look, you have to do it because your hand might be in a different place. You want the measurements to be consistent. So you want to start with a fresh measure. Oh, that's three across. That's pretty cool. So we've got one, two, I'm way off. off. Okay, so here's part of the problem. If I draw a line straight down the corner of that ball from my point of view, the corner is over here. So this is triangulation. That shortens up that side pretty significantly, and this is very sharply oblique. Remember, parallel lines going into the distance are going to converge. So keep in mind which way your parallel lines are going away from you. Now let's see if I back it up, go the other direction, go this way. One, two, three, and then make this end here. Now it should be the same height as it is width, so let me just check it. Yep. And then what did I say? Three up to the very back. One, two, three. There. Okay, so that's correct. So I've checked myself on my measurements using sighting against an object. If you didn't have the ball there, you could say, all right, I'm going to measure the top of the box and then see how many tops of the box actually fit in the side of the box. You could do it that way. And that will help you see that the comparison of the top of the object that you can see is not as big as you think it is. It never is. It's always going to be a little bit smaller than than your mind wants to make it. One, two, three. So this is just under three of these in the front of the box. So there we go. It's just under three. See how that works? Does that make sense? Oh, come on. Network difficulties. Okay. As long as you understand, that's good. I'm also um, recording this through OBS, so it should have better quality on the recording. Now that I've done that, I want to draw my dragon. So my dragon is going to be gestural. This is still a sketch. This is not the final drawing. So I, I'm, I've got all these rough marks in there and a little bit of bleed over. And clean that up a little bit. Like so. 
my dragon his and I'm looking to see where his his parts are in relation so this goes back to the figure drawing this goes back to developing your um, character even if you have a little model of if you, you're doing the character design and you've got a little model of your animal and a, and a mannequin you can use those and position them in such a way that you try to get the pieces to line up or I, what I would do is sculpt it. That's what we used to do, and that's what they used to do in the old days. They sculpt it instead of trying to just make it up. Of course, to sculpt it, you still have to know about the anatomy and stuff. Okay, so little dragon's head is here, above the back of this thing, and on the on the painting, this is actually a shelf. So this works out really well because this matches up to the the depth of the shelf that he's going to be standing on. He's got one claw here. And I'm, I remember I drew this guy before and I was not impressed at the anatomy. So I will use this as a guide and then go back and refine the anatomy to be more accurate because if you put wings on a four-legged creature, actually, I think what I did was I took the arms off. And I'm going to do that again because the arms are superfluous. They really don't need to be there. There are no vertebrates with four, with more than four limbs. They don't exist. Not vertebrates. Insects, sure. So, D Dylan, are you doing with the insect? So you can have multiple limbs on yours. So, um, so Jose, before you go, did you understand that that idea of measuring the top in relationship to the sides, so that you can get the you don't have to don't have to change it much. You just have to change it. Okay, okay. So it's just a matter of of checking all your all, and also check vertically. Like I noticed, um, I think it's in the feedback, but if you hold your pencil up flat and you measure from one corner of the box and see how far above or below the other corner is, that can help you get things in into their proper positions and coordinates. So you use the triangulation technique, you use the sighting technique, and you use this kind of point-to-point -point thing, placing those points on your paper, and or how close thing, measure the stuff in between as well. And if you can block out, if you want to block out that back shadow, then put something up to block the um, uh, the light from getting behind your object. Is is uh, okay? So you you I'm sorry. You can go if you have any other questions. Contact me directly, and and I'll I'll be up for a while. So you're really close, and and your the rendering is really nice. Okay. Um, sure. And let's see, is Sarah back yet? No. All right, my little dragon guy. I've been thinking about the anatomy the whole time. So when you do when you do your drawings for for you guys that have the anatomy stuff, the um, character design. When you do your sketch to do your character design, your actual, this the third task where you're supposed to do the all the different parts on layers in Photoshop, if you need a little extra time on that, don't worry about it because I will um, be happy to work with you on that because it's very complicated. So um, make a gesture drawing. Make your, make your drawing interesting so that he's in like a stance. If you have to get somebody to model for you, that's even better. In fact, if you get somebody to model for you, I'll give you extra credit. Um, have a humanoid that's modeling for you. Also, be relatively experimental with the anatomy. It doesn't always have to be a human body with an animal head, like a minotaur. It could be an animal body with a human head, which would be like a manticore. I think mean, I, you know, I'm making that assumptions that they, they're related to mythical creatures because that's really where my focus is. 
Um, ah, you see, so this is so bad now because I've drawn over it so much, but that's okay. It's just a gesture sketch. And I'm thinking about his spine, and I'm thinking about his his arms, which now are wings, wings, arms. That's the way it should be. And these are his fingers, because I know that's how bats' wings are, and bird wings, when you study the anatomy of other creatures. These the things that come off the end of the, the wings are actually what used to be fingers. And you can even see that. And that's what you're supposed to do with your assignment anyway, is you draw the skeleton and then you match up the parts of the skeleton, right? So you can, draw, you can do all this um, traditionally. You don't have to do it digitally, but what I like to do is combine. In fact, if you guys want, I can show you a project that I did both with a mix of traditional. It's not this kind of a project, but it's the same idea where there's a, a combination of um, digital and traditional. I did the sketches traditionally, scanned them in, imported them into Photoshop, and made them uh, into digital images. There's a way to do it easily with a batch process where you can batch them in and batch them out so that you don't have to do it one at a time. It's it's uh, that because you have to make a PDF out of all of your JPEGs. So if you have to make your JPEGs off of your Photoshop file, there's an easy way to do that. I'm going to do that as a separate recording. Um, I want to draw my little guy here. So we've got all these shadows. I, I don't know what this could be. If this was in a scene, you know, probably what it would be is a, a big lump of gold, because don't dragons like gold? They do. Actually, in the painting that I'm going to do, these are going to be dice, or these several sided die, dice, dice with different sides. So I can put the little fairy down here, too. So we can put a little figure in there. I should put her. I should have put her arms up to make her go. Oh, I'm hiding from the dragon. You know, whatever. Can't see her feet. Her feet are right here. So this could be a person in relationship to my creature, and by drawing it all out in an actual format like this, it makes it look more realistic. So it's just like when you put um, little tiny miniature buildings and you get really small and you video inside them and then you composite the people running through them like like matte painting. I actually had a friend and I have it in, in the link the links that I send out for that they're in the um, websites of interest. There's a guy in there that I went to school with who got his master's degree at the same time I did and his focus was on matte painting and my focus was on the figure. And he did a bunch of matte paintings on glass, just like they do, did it traditionally. And then he started his own company of doing digital matte painting, and he did all these matte paintings for Babylon 5 and uh, young Indiana Jones, and he won a couple of, of special effects awards. And he did it all in computer, but he learned how to do it really first with real materials. So you translate those those skills over easily into the computer and take advantage of the tool, extra tools they had. So he would build his set, this, the backdrop with just very simple three-dimensional objects that he could then light and do a rendering and then you paint over it. So what I was saying before is that's how they're going to do the concept art. That's how a lot of people do conceptual art for production now because it's much faster. You can get everything set up and rendered and then you paint over it and make it look awesome. But you have to know how to paint. And you have to have painted from from observation, from real stuff, so that you know how painting is supposed to look. Is that making any sense? I don't know. I hope it does. All right, let me finish my little dragon guy. Now, do you guys want to see that trick with Photoshop? I'm looking at the chat box. Well, Lillian, you're not in the class. I'm, I know you want to. I want to know if the, the people that are in the class that have to do this as an assignment. <laughs> Danel, 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 and Dylan, do you guys want to see that? Oh, my goodness. I have such a headache. What am I thinking? Not much. So I'll have to 
figure out how better to draw his claws, make it more realistic. But it's nice to be able to not have to con totally conceptualize the figure. <laughs> you don't have to exclude yourself. I didn't mean it that way. And there's his tail. And I would actually like his tail to come back up and whip around. So, because I kind of know how light falls on objects. I know the light's coming from here. And we've got this light here, and we've got this shadow here. And I made his foot much bigger on purpose. His foot's coming more towards this. But that was a choice that I made. His wing is casting a shadow here. It's shadowed under here. So doing a value study is super useful to any kind of conceptual work. The underside of the wing, this side of the wing. This is a rough draft that I wouldn't necessarily show to anyone. Except maybe the client, once they got it cleaned up a little bit. So, okay. That is the essence, essence of roughing in the still life. If you need to do that, you can put in a bit of a fill if you want to have the object here, it should be a little cleaner than that. This is pretty messy. For the second task, it really should be a little bit more um, detailed out than that. But you can do a just a rough indication of where the shadow shapes are without having to go into great detail on the shading. You just want to indicate where the value is. And don't need to bother filling in all the background with value. And we're going to shadow right here. And this is in shadow here. So, like so. Okay. I'm going to stop that. 